This week's episode of The Horror Show with Brian Keene is brought to you by The Book of David by Robert Kent. The Walters family has just purchased the perfect home, if only it weren't located in the small hick town of Harrington, Indiana, and if only it weren't haunted. David Walters is an atheist, but his minister father taught him from a young age that Satan would one day deceive all mankind by pretending his demons were extraterrestrials. The day the Walters family moves in, they spot a flying saucer outside their new home. David Walters is about to learn what it means to be truly haunted, forcing him to confront his past, fight for his family, his soul, and his sanity. The Book of David by Robert Kent, the host of the Middle Grade Ninja podcast, is available as a single volume or five serialized novels, the first of which is available to download for free, free, Whenever you're hearing this, wherever fine ebooks are sold, it's also available in paperback. For more information, head to middlegradeninja.com. That's the Book of David by Robert Kent. No comment, sir. What about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- what part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f- Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keane, brought to you by the Project <laughs> Entertainment Network and available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, YouTube, and all other platforms. Project Entertainment Radio also brings you that coughing from Matt Dandelion Wilson there in the background. Oh my god, I was holding that in the entire ad read. <laughs> Were you really? I was choking it back. Dave, Dave, are you holding anything in during the ad read? Uh, no, because uh, when I got up this morning, it was 13 degrees, so I'm still pretty much frozen. Okay, Mary, how about you? Yeah. Are you holding anything in? Only my love for you, darling. I am surprised. I am Good shocked. answer. Good answer. <laughs> shocked. <laughs> that none of you, <coughs> all of you are coughing, holding in love, but none of you were holding in your glee that returning once again to the fold. <laughs> Occasional co-host, too good for us now, Mr. Mike Lombardo. I actually go by Mike Cookie Lips Lombardo now. <laughs> Cookie, Cookie Lips. lips. <laughs> uh, Dandelion that's Cookie from, Lips. Uh, that's from the Indian Festation podcast that I'm now <laughs> an occasional host on as well. <laughs> I feel like we need to know why it's Cookie Lips. <laughs> We do. We do. Legally, I can't tell you that right now. This, but. this week's show was going to be uh, yeah. a book club discussion of C.V. Hunt's ritualistic human sacrifice. That's but, out the window. Yeah, yeah I, I feel like it needs to turn yeah. now. <laughs> I have many questions. Well, I want to point out, before we get started, I just want to point out, there's five of us here in the room, so that's six more people who listen to watch the Horror Syndicate every week than he's on, so... <laughs> Yeah. Good this, job. This is true. Good and, job. and a reminder to folks, if if the show sounds different, it's still, as Dave said, it's 13 degrees. It's too cold to record the yeah. studio. We're doing this in the living room. So, okay, first of all, why cookie lips? I can't talk about that. You really can't. See, huh? this scares you me understand. that it's like legal. <laughs> you understand that this is a podcast and what this we do is, is we talk. This is a whole, that's a whole other episode. All right. There's still legal things going on, but. All right. And the name of this podcast is. I'm so, no, this is the horror show with Brian. No, yes. <laughs> it's, it's like the We're trivia. So it's like the trivia back. questions yeah. we do with Mary Lips. But the the one that calls you Cookie Lips is oh oh I'm uh, I'm I've been an occasion an occasional guest host on Indian Festation. Indian Festation. Yes, that's uh, Justin Seaman, Zan Hershberger, and Joseph Fidos the third. The third. Yes, wow. the third. Any relation to Carlton Mellick the third? I don't know. Any relation to Jason V. Brock? <laughs> Let's I don't believe so. <laughs> I don't um, think anybody will admit to that. <laughs> so, Indian Festation, 
the horror show at Brian Keene, horror syndicate, mm. and a couple others that I'm not allowed to speak about because of the whole cookie lips thing. <laughs> At the end of the show, I'll give you guys the 900 number. <laughs> you know, it'll, be, it'll be great. You know, hmm. oh, right. you direct all these, these short films. They do very well. You direct your first feature. It blows up, sweeps the film festival circuit, wins all these awards available now on Blu-ray and DVD. And VHS. And VHS. Nice. And you follow that up with... Podcast hosting, just bouncing from podcast to podcast. <laughs> I'll tell you. I, I mean, we had to hire Matt just to replace you because you couldn't be <laughs> here. You, I do a lot of podcasts now. But unfortunately, most of them never air, or I never hear about them again. But <laughs> <laughs> I get, I get invited. Never air. I never hear about them ever again. <laughs> it's, it's like I was trying to go back through for like a press section on the Real Spotter site and find like all the old interviews I've done, and half of them are gone. <laughs> I'm not sure. If I'm, I'm not sure why. I have my suspicions about the content well, of that. I'm pretty sure we can <laughs> guess. <laughs> there's, Mike the Plague Lombardo. There's a, yeah, right. There's a lot of things that's just funny to like listen to a podcast from like 2006, where I'm like, you know, I think I'm gonna do this. You know, at the time, Holiday Holocaust, which turned into White Doomsday. Like, right. So all it's really fun to listen to all these old shit, but a lot of them just disappear. Like horror sites come and go like weekly. It's yeah, kind of well, fun. yeah, they do. You know, I, I would point out to you that every single one of your appearances on this program That's right. are archived. They're all available on iTunes and Spotify. They're, most of them are now available on YouTube. So of course, that's the pending court case. That, you know, that's, you turn state's evidence on me. Did you talk about that? <laughs> no, we haven't talked about that, Cookie Lips. That's a topic for a true crime podcast that I'm also on. <laughs> To catch a predator podcast. <laughs> it's actually called Sweets to the Sweet. Um, the cookie lift story. <laughs> Jeez. We were, worried that it's, we were worried there would be nothing to talk about. So, <laughs> Matt, is it weird for you to be in the room when Lombardo is also on the air? No. I actually I kind of feel like a weird kinship to him. Well, you're, 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 one of, you're one of the only co-hosts that has never a restraining order against the <laughs> So, so for yes. you to go on all the on podcasts, it either there's there there ends up being legal problems. It either dies or <laughs> like wherever you were, they're just like pull the episode. Cut. Yeah. It's, it's too much. That you motherfucker know. made a movie that was good. Get it the get, get the episode you out. You know, here. I wasn't going to mention this in the air because I wasn't going to give him any press. But uh, <laughs> that 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 guy from Dark Regions Press, uh, Chris Mori, he posted on Facebook. And if he says he didn't, I've got the screenshot to, to prove that you did it, Chris. He said uh, that he is talking with several litigation attorneys about holding us accountable for things we say here on the air. Well, the things we say here on the air, we've got screenshots or emails or sources who are willing to go on record. Um, so, you know, you're welcome to, to, to do whatever you think you want to do. But I, I, I see now it's not what we said on the air. It's Lombardo. <laughs> Yeah. It's Lombardo. Basically. I mean, you know. <laughs> it's the curse. The curse of the cookie lips. <laughs> I want to call this episode The Curse of the Cookie Lips. Hunt's ritualistic human sacrifice. Yeah. But Slash. I, it, and then in parentheses, The Curse, the curse of the cookie, cookie Lips. Unfortunately, that's too many characters. That's right. way too many characters. Way too many characters. I feel so. like this needs to be something written for true crime. <laughs> the Curse of Cookie Lips. Well, Mary's, Mary's sister is is going to be launching a, a true crime prod, podcast. Nice. Uh, perhaps she can have Lombardo on the first episode. <laughs> oh, God. And then she'll never do it again. There's no story wide open, you know? He just walks in the room and her computer just ignites yeah, in the totally flames. Get, get all the facts. <laughs> exactly. Matt, Matt, have you had him on Grindcast yet? I have not. No, I haven't. <laughs> well, you you want to come on and ruin my podcast? <laughs> hold, hold, wait, 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 seriously? Grinder has a podcast? No. No. <laughs> no, Matt's not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> I don't want to be on. <laughs> okay, well, we'll work something out. You can come on and ruin my show. Absolutely. <laughs> I'd be honored. <laughs> you could go on Cosmic Shenanigans. Uh, no. Who, is, Dave, is there a podcast that we don't like? Um, oh, there's many. I, I mean, <laughs> I, oh, there's many. I personally, I personally them? can't think of one. Three that, guys with beards. Oh. I mean, I guess 
Kevin Strange, Jeremy Matt. I don't think they're doing they, theirs I don't anymore, think they, right? I, I think they vanished. They, yeah, I think they shut that down. <laughs> Were you on their show recently? <laughs> yeah, I just haven't seen it. I mean, we can, we can use Lombardo them. like a bioweapon. Yeah, it's like, like <laughs> you know. It wouldn't be the first time. Yeah. yeah. Send in the Lombardo. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, what, who, who's that? Kodaki uh, Lips. <laughs> archive, what is it? Archive Dad, is oh, those sexy witches or whatever. That she's is. not fond of us, right? No, she hates us. Okay, yeah. Lombardo, there you go. We're gonna have you as a guest on her podcast. I've been on that podcast a bunch of times. You have, yeah. So, it so but it's work. still on the air. So, <laughs> it I, it's, I, you know, there's no accounting for taste, I suppose. You know, and I, you know, <laughs> people continue to listen to the ballad of. Alright, Karinga. <laughs> Jack Oringa, here's yeah. the deal. Yeah. Okay. Now we've been asking you for five years uh, to have a podcast category on the Shirley Jackson Awards, and yet you have refused. If you do not add a podcast category to the Shirley Jackson Awards, we are sending Mike Lombardo to the Shirley Jackson Awards. <laughs> he could MC it. Yes. Yeah. He could MC ever. it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I've already got my opening line. This yeah. is surely going to be a great night. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. This is what I, I want. Feel Lombardo, free to use that one, Lombardo, Jack. and either Livia Llewellyn or Laird Barron co-hosting with yes. me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Have to or all you. three. All three. <laughs> and like halfway yeah. through, Laird just finally ha- can't take it anymore <laughs> <laughs> and just snaps yeah. Lombardo's neck. <laughs> He wants this of you. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see Olivia's face like, what? What? What is going on? Here? What is going on? All right. Well, I do want to remind folks that uh, now we mentioned that. Somebody snap his neck. <laughs> so, <laughs> there, take care of Cookie Lips. We mentioned that uh, uh, I'm Dreaming of a White Doomsday is out now on Blu-ray and DVD and VHS. And, of course, uh, Matt's new book, Edge of Twilight, my new book, Hole in the World, and uh, Mary's forthcoming book, Inside the Asylum. Yes. Did I get it right this week? Right. You did. Very good. Yeah. You did. All of those are available right now. Golf clap. Um, <laughs> and yes, coming up after this bit of nonsense, we are in fact going to discuss C.V. Hunt's Ritualistic Human Sacrifice. Mike, have you read that book? It is two books down on my TBR pile. All right. So. Yeah. But I already know pretty much what well, happened. So yeah, we're okay. not gonna. I don't think we're gonna do spoilers. We usually avoid spoilers, so I, I think you'll eh, be okay. Be spoilers, I think. You think? Okay. Yeah. Um, I I see that the cats are, are joining you on the <laughs> yeah. podcast. Yeah. In there. What was that, noise? <laughs> that was that was oh, Spike, funny. Mary's cat. Yeah. Oh my kitty. Um. So. Oh my cat. Before we do that, though, Mike, because it's a rare opportunity to have you here. Well, it's not really rare to have me, but <laughs> I mean, it's rare to have you on this show. Fra- phrasing? Can we start True. doing phrasing? <laughs> Jack Ranga. How? He's right now. He's running up the award. He's like, oh, they've won. I, I would love to, I'm sorry, but I would love to see Jack interview Mike. Tell me that wouldn't be the oh greatest interview ever. Oh my god! Tell me that Fuck be- doing a telethon this yeah. year. That's yeah. what we need to yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> We raise X amount of dollars, that interview happens. And get you, Mike in the evening with cookie lips. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> get Mike drunk and, and make Jack lips. stay sober. Yes. 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 <laughs> or give Jack one, just one. No. <laughs> just one to nurse the no. whole time. <laughs> just a little, soften him up a little bit. Just soften him up because I, then, then he gets snarky. Like a nice soft yeah. baked cookie dough. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Yes. How has how has life changed following the success and the release of Doomsday? Um, I don't sleep much these days. Why? Um, just the nightmares, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, no, things have been really good. Uh, the movie's doing really excellent. Um, lots and lots and lots of people are coming out and saying how much they love it, which is great. Because I spend most of my day trying to tamp down my ego. Because now strangers are starting to say the movie's really good, so I have I can't. It's a weird thing, right? Yeah, I'm like I can't say that you're just saying that because I paid you. <laughs> so that's been it's been really cool. People are asking about the next project. Um, I actually took a break from trying to write another script because I have a the next feature I'm planning, but I started writing some <coughs> short fiction because I haven't done that in fucking god knows when. So I wrote a few short stories and. I do a lot of interviews and shit for stuff, which is cool. I'm yep. actually going to be at Monster Mania this weekend at the Scream Team nice. table. Yeah. Which is cool. Uh, so people are excited to meet me, which is funny. 
And uh, the uh, White Rose Comic Con um, guys just said... That's that they, right. We uh, should talk yeah, about yeah. the White Rose Comic Con. Um, stall for me, Dave, while I pull up the information here. I, yes. Um, so, do, like, do people come into the pizza shop and... Oh, yeah. And actually, a lot of people want to buy it from me at the pizza oh, shop. Oh, that's, but, which is that's cool, actually but, really cool, but you can't do it. There. No, I was, I was like, yeah. go to the website. Yeah. I'll tell you, it's really fun because everybody... When someone goes to buy a movie, their first thought is go to Amazon.com. And it is available on Amazon.com. But as uh, the biggest thing that's changed in my life uh, since the movie came out is I hate Amazon now because they take 55% of every yeah. sale. Oh yes, God, they do. Dude. And they yeah. also have to pay for shipping to their warehouse and yeah. warehousing fees. Like, they what? fuck you so hard. It's unreal. So I always tell people, it's like, you should buy direct from the distributor. You get a poster. You can get a signed copy. It's cheaper. Uh-huh. And everyone's like, yeah. got it, Amazon. <laughs> I got yeah, it. The it's distributor more expensive on Amazon, but people, you know, the Amazon sales. It's, it's a comfort zone for people. Yeah, it really yeah absolutely. Is. It's yeah. weird. I do it too, but now I feel awful, and I'm like, I'm buying direct from everybody now. Like, fuck Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's insane. Do people? Do you get the the people that think, well, you have a movie out now that they can buy on Amazon? Why are you still working here in the pizza oh, shop? Oh yeah, I get that. I mean, I've been getting that for years, but now, especially now, people are like. So you're going to, like, go to Hollywood, right? And I'm like, you know, Spielberg was calling me the other day, but I was on the phone with Cameron, so I'm like, ah, guys, come on. See, you people, know, I can only hold so many briefcases full of money. <laughs> yeah, people don't understand that. There's, like, there's a few, like, metal bands that I was into that had made it big recently, but, like, back in the day when they, they were still putting out albums for professional studios and everything, but, like, the lead singers would, like, work at a Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. That's You know, it's just like... Any kind of... Any kind of uh, Unless you hit that super big payday, you know, yeah. that, that one time yeah. super big payday, any kind of entertainment field is, like, you know, working in the trenches for years and years yeah. before it's sustainable. No, well, that's what it is. And actually, I've had a couple people that are, like, a couple people got kind of shitty with me. They're like, oh, well, you know, now that you're, you know, you're doing, like, this this big movie shit. And it's like, I was like, guys, I've been doing this for, like, 16 years and I finally, finally, like, made, like, an inch of progress. Yeah. Like, now I'm not openly mocked by my peers. <laughs> it's like, no. Jesus. That is now funny how I... Like, like, yeah. yeah. Like, that, that is rather funny. How, how many yeah. years has it been since you graduated high school? Uh, I graduated in 05, so was that 13 years 13 now? years. So we we'll, going on 14 years. Will you go to your 15th year high school reunion and roll in there and, and say, Doomsday, motherfuckers? <laughs> I wouldn't. I didn't go to any of the reunions, not because I I have a an issue with anybody I went to school with. It's just the people that I like from school. I still talk to on a regular basis, right? Because of Facebook and shit. So it's just like I'm not paying sixty bucks. It's, it's, it's like our high school reunions are at public bars. They just charge a ticket price. And I was like, "What the hell is this?" I just go in there unrelated. I'm like, "Oh, hey, what? Everyone just happens to be here tonight as well. <laughs> How about that?" <laughs> All I can do is not touch the uh, the pizza buffet, which in this point in my life I don't really is not a draw for me anymore. <laughs> it's like I'm pretty sure I made that. That's what I've been up to the last fifteen years. <laughs> Dave, while Mike was talking, you were looking at the equipment. Everything okay? Oh, that's fine. I, I was. I don't blame the guy. The I mean, the battery. <laughs> Why not? I mean, so yeah, you we've brought got up cookie lips equipment here. You on the brought couch. up White Rose Comic Con co- yes. cookie lips. We should talk <laughs> about that. Um, White Rose Comic Con, I like it because it's literally taking place 20 minutes from my house. Yep. I don't have to travel. I don't have to get a hotel. Um, it's taking place uh, March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. So the end of this month. Oh, right around the corner. Uh, yeah, at uh, the York Fairgrounds here in York, <coughs> Pennsylvania. Um, now, you can meet me. You can meet Mary. You can meet Lombardo. You can meet Kelly Owen, Robert Ford, Stephen Kozanowski, Wesley Southard, Summer Cannon. Did I get... Chris Enderline. Artist Chris Enderline. Um, but that's not all. You can meet comic book legend Jim Steranko. Oh, nice. You can meet two of the original Village people. <laughs> really? Really. Oh, shit, I didn't know that. The, the Indian and the construction worker. Native American. Excuse me, the yeah, Native yeah. American. But you have to remember. <laughs> He's oh, I check your privilege. I grew up. <laughs> in the set, I bought that first Village People album. I had it. I had that doesn't had mean it you on can vinyl. Those people. And it, 
when he appeared on American Bandstand and Dick Clark, they 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 referred to him as the Indian. So I, even though I know Native American is the proper term, I believe actually I now think it's indigenous people. Indigenous people. I still think of that character as the Indian, and I admit it's my privilege. I'm 52, 51. Fuck you. You got me all flustered now. <laughs> You know what? It's the construction worker and the guy uh, who wears the feathers. Manual laborer. <laughs> manual laborer? <laughs> and I believe they like to be called OG Americans. <laughs> That's true. I was a fan of the village people back when they were still neon maniacs. <laughs> yeah, right? So, two I of the village people. Refer to be re- re- referred Not to one, but two. Two, two. two of the village people. Two of the village uh, people. Various cast members from American Horror Story. I'm excited about that. You're excited much. about that. I am. Um, so yeah, it's a it's an eclectic mix. Um, it'll be an interesting mix. Uh, we're gonna record the horror show there, Dave. You will not be there. No, I will not be there. Um, but we're. I think we're just gonna. We're gonna. Just. I think Kelly and I have a panel, if I understand correctly. Uh, okay. So I thought I would just bring a recorder and record. It'll probably be me and Kelly and like an audience of one. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, yeah. Okay. so we'll just, yeah, we'll, we'll, re- Bob and I will come. I'm going to well, throw yeah, this out there. Kelly is, she doesn't talk. She's so quiet and demure, so <laughs> I, I don't know what you're going to get on the tape, well, but if you guys that. don't have much going on, then I can bring a recorder as well and play hot cross buns. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember. <laughs> now, has the convention <laughs> talked to you about being on the local news to promote the convention? The White Rose? Yeah. Uh, no, I just they, they want Kelly and I to go on the local Fox station before the convention and, and talk about and promote the convention as you do mm-hmm. and we're willing to do that but I, I think that you should probably go on our local PBS station I would love to because that I'm week will, that PBS. week will also be pledge week fun fundraising week for PBS uh, I I think I can either tank them or, or blow them through the roof <laughs> it's one or the other cookie lips gives with one hand and takes with the other <laughs> Matt will, will you be at the White Rose Comic Con uh, if I'm allowed to be, <laughs> I, don't know, I think you're. I, I didn't know. Well, I don't. I don't. I know sometimes, like when you have a panel set, they don't have a plus one that you can bring or whatever. I don't think. So I, I think you'll have to pay to get in. Well, that's now, just. But <laughs> but Comics Connection has a vendor table. Do they though? Maybe you can talk to them about running their vendor table, and then you get a dealer pass. Maybe. Uh, well, maybe. Uh, I, don't I don't think they like me. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, no. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> what? <laughs> we're learning all sorts of things. Today. You know, Carrie, I promise we're going to get to your book at some point during the show. <laughs> Sit right now, Carrie's saying, you know what, you guys? Don't talk about my book. She's probably like sitting there on the slider on bar, just be like, okay, when are they going to actually fucking... 20 minutes in, we're still not fucking talking about my book. I wanted, I wanted Bill and Ned at Comics Connection to come on this show and talk about how comics retailing has changed over the years. I would love I to talk to them about that. They yeah. think, I miss those guys. They think that no one is interested in that. And I can't convince them. I tried to talk to them about that before, like coming on my show and talking about it. Yeah. And I don't think Bill wants to be on podcasts. I think he's uh Well Bill is old he's scared about he, it. He's <laughs> older Bill's older than I he's like Dave's age, so he's really up there. Oh, yeah, yeah, um yeah. Yeah, that, whole five, that whole five years difference is just insane. You're just skyrocketing yeah, in yeah. age. Let's not go with the ages I'm turning thirty two on Saturday and I'm not feeling great about it, so no, I mean, oh, you know, oh. it down. I'm turning thirty six tomorrow. <laughs> I've known Bill and Ned. I'm going to be 32 for several years now. Ned. I've known Bill and Ned, oh my God, since uh, since 1986, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, there's only a couple years difference between us. But, and I feel old mostly now, you know, at 51. I, yeah, I, I do feel very good. But Bill got old, old. He doesn't look it, but inside. Like... I love you, Bill, but That's you know it's it true. It starts yeah. inside. I, I, I love Bill, too, and one of the things... And I brought this up to him like one of the last times I saw him. I was like, you've done that thing now on Facebook where you've turned into the guy that hates everything. <laughs> that is, like, current social media or, like, how people, like, perceive pop culture. I'm that guy, like, too. Yeah, I mean, I mean like, he, he's just extremely vocal yeah. about it all the time. Like, I remember last Halloween, he was like, yeah, it's so great to live in a world where a bunch of adults celebrate Halloween. Like a bunch of kids, and I'm like, you should, I love you, you should actually be happy with that because th- those people are the ones that buy what you're peddling. Yeah. <laughs> I felt a perverse sense of pride the other day because 
Chloe Kardashian came up in my news feed, and I realized that I don't know who Chloe Kardashian is. I don't know who any of the Kardashians are. I know that they're famous because I hear people talk about them. But to this day, I couldn't tell you if they're singers or actresses or what they've done. And I, I'm very proud of myself <coughs> for not knowing. That's and don't tell me who they are because I don't. I don't want to spoil I, my record. It's okay. I know who they are, but I still don't even. I'm give a in shit that what same. Point of view. <laughs> Last a couple days ago, uh, made the news everywhere that. Ar- Aria Grande yeah. was at Whole Foods and Target. The, my roommates and stuff. Matt, oh yeah, I so heard my feet was flooded with everyone taking pictures. And my first thought was, the lady that runs the cheese company we get our mozzarella from is Grande <laughs> Cheese. And I'm like, why the hell do you guys care about that? Everybody's she's like, a, she has she's a cheese a company. Like, literally, that's Selfie. what I associate Grande with. And I'm like, the fuck. <coughs> And she's like a super famous pop star. I'm like, I have never heard of this person in my life. And everyone's like, no. And they're singing the songs. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. So I started listening to the radio for the last couple of days. And I'm like, I don't know what any of this shit is. <laughs> I Because if I used your logic for that whole thing, I would associate her with a size of coffee that I buy at her coffee store. <laughs> <laughs> that's more current than a, than a Jersey it's, taste cheese coffee. That's a, that's a, <laughs> I, I'm not a fan of audiobooks, but Phoebe listens to audiobooks when she's driving the car now. Mm-hmm. Which is a good thing. You know, and the reason why is because she used to listen to the radio. Yeah. And then she would tell me about things she hears on the radio. And I've listened to the radio since 1993, I think is when KNAC and LA. Yeah, you don't need theater. to. It's complete yeah, garbage. No, it's garbage. <laughs> yeah. So I don't listen to the radio, so I never know like who any of these people are. And and she listened to it, and then she would like make me put those songs on my phone. And now she listens uh, to Victor Laval talking all the time. It's so much better. Thank you, Victor Laval. <laughs> I, I praise you for freaking keeping me away from pop music and onto audiobooks. So did you, you did you see Wally Young's memes oh, about yes. Phoebe and Victor? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't think Victor was amused. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I, I I'm kidding. I, I, I know. Uh, I thought he was amused. I, th- I I saw I thought I saw a comedy maybe or something, but th- no, those were very funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they were Wally Young is is quite the entertaining individual. All right. Yeah. His so. memes are great. So anyway, yes, White Rose Comic Con, um, and again, that is uh, this month, March 22nd, 23rd, 24th. Come meet us and the village people. Um, <laughs> go to whiterosecomiccon.com for ticket information, etc. Nice. So, Mike, will you in- get your picture taken with the village people? <sighs> I don't know. I just had to check, dust off the old restraining orders, and see if they're still <laughs> I mean, with your new nickname, I feel like it's mandatory that you get this yeah. picture. I mean, it's, it's possible that, they, they, that it's possibly forgotten me. But see, I don't remember because it was, even that back in the day, that wasn't my thing. But you have the. The, the construction worker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, the OG American. No, the manual laborer. Manual yeah, laborer. Get it right, Dave. OG American. Who you had the, the other police. There was the, the samurai, police right? the surgeon. What? The <laughs> we're talking about neon maniacs, right? <laughs> no, the, no, we're talking. <laughs> the surgeon was, was the doctor from Prince's oh, Revolution. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really confused. So, okay, the village people. The vil- a police the village officer. Vil- Law enforcement sailor. specialist. Law, law enforcement specialist. Was there a naval officer of some type? There was no. There was a sailor. Was there? Yeah. Yes. No, I don't think I there like was there a sailor. Was. I might have just been in that video. Swear to God, there the was Navy. a sailor. I don't know if there. Or maybe it just was in for in the Navy. Yeah. Now you I need might to know. Right. I'm looking up village people. Yeah, on dude, my phone. because I was like trying to think. Like, I know the three professions for sure. Oh, <laughs> no, there was a biker. Hold on. A biker. Oh, a biker. biker. That's right. The biker. Because he was wearing the assless chaps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it actually was Rob Halford's like, first. Uh... And there was a, there was a, a, a naval <laughs> officer. Uh. It looks like a cowboy, maybe. Oh, there, there's. I thought there were only four village One, two, three, people. I think she's just looking at different costumes. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I'm sorry. This is my porn she's app. On the sorry. Spirit, <laughs> the Spirit Halloween app. Get off a of porn hub. This is my porn app. My bad. No, there's a cowboy. <laughs> Police officer, a sailor, a, a biker. This is claws. Um, <laughs> construction worker. <laughs> an indigenous <laughs> person. And I'm going to have to go out in the office and pull up my old Village People vinyl. I only remember there being four of them. Yeah, I thought there was only like four or five. But I, Actually, I there's, yeah, oh, yeah, there's, there's like so. six okay. right huh. there. And apparently they have a song wait, called wait, Go who's Santa Who's the guy in the top? Is he like a he's helicopter the, pilot? Well, I think he's the cop, I think. Why, the cop? Why, why, why is he as, as, since there's two Village People. <laughs> no, they're all wearing like hats. I think Mike It's like a chips kind of. See, 
I would bet you twenty dollars that West Southern doesn't know who the Village People are. It doesn't matter. But the problem is, he listens to the show, so yeah. he'll fucking Google. Them. <laughs> you always have to think that. The, I mean, he he didn't know who King Diamond was. But you don't have to think that the song was right, so yeah, the like, Malta Meal cause cereal. Because he, here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Lord. Can I punch him? Go, 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 go. <laughs> West Southern is a hockey fan. Why is he played all sorts of sporting events? So I can imagine he doesn't know what they do. Does it still get played? Oh, God, yes. That's nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's like nice. every Orioles game they play. Yeah. What about uh, Queen? Oh. We will rock you. We are yeah, the champions. No, they still yeah. play that. I, you know, I don't know that YMCA is really relevant these days because like, when I hear that, I think about walking in on people jerking off in the showers. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, you will never hear me make fun of the YMCA. They're, uh, no. I, most listeners. Readers definitely know this. I don't know if listeners do. For a brief time in my life, I was, in fact, homeless. And it was the YMCA where I found a place to, to get off the streets. But, yeah, there was a lot of people jerking off in the shower. I don't think they let homeless people in the YMCA. They have to pay to get in there now. Now you do, something. yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, you didn't have to use it for that. Yeah. 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 I shower elsewhere now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but where do you jerk off? That's the question. <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> I actually, is I actually, that really the question? I actually chronicled that entire portion Keen, of my life. Why are we going to talk about this fucking book? In a, in a, I, it's in a, segue, it's a new, segue. My, my new tell-all book, Cookie Lips in the Sticky Situation. <laughs> cookie Lips in the Cream Filling. And the Cookie Jar. And speaking of tell-all books... <laughs> oh, fuck! From Robert Kent. <laughs> That's not icing. That's <laughs> gonna die. We have fucked up this man's ad read. Oh, no, it's chocolate. He's currently yes. doing it. He's killing us. Just, when, when our mom sells an ad on this show, does he make him sign a waiver? Like, well, I'm not I, responsible I think, for what that should be in the I, email. I, like I your ad, like, it's <laughs> more like people they click the, the the button and then they put one round in the chamber and it's like, <laughs> like is Lombardo going to be on or not? <laughs> Oh shit! All right, stop, stop, stop. All right. <laughs> All right. I may have run the blood vessel. From Robert Kent, host of the Middle Grade Ninja podcast, comes the Book of David, a serial horror novel written in the style of early Stephen King. Uh, the Book of David is available as a single volume or as five serialized novels. If you would like to read the serialized novels. The first one is available to download for free. Doesn't matter when you're listening to this. <clears throat> Thursday night, a year from now, whenever, the book is going to be available for free wherever fine ebooks are sold. It's also available in paperback. For more information, head to middlegradeninja.com. All right. So, CB Hunt. Meat and potatoes. Ritualistic <laughs> Human Sacrifice, published by Grindhouse Press. I'm holding it up here, even though the uh, the audience can't see it. Published in 2015. Now, I raved about this book the year it came out. It made my annual list of 10 best books of that year. Uh, I gave it a blurb at the time. I said, I've seen the future of extreme horror, and it is C.V. Hunt. A play on Stephen King's blurb for Clive Barker, I've seen the future of horror. Um... So my thoughts on this book are well documented. They're out there. <clears throat> um, so what I want to do, I want to go to you guys first, and then I'm going to come back with a little bit of historical perspective. Um, so who wants, Dave, you want to start? I'll start because I picked the book. All right. Um, All right. I, the, the reason I picked it, several reasons. Um, you know, cause we, I previously picked the book, which we had done as well, The Ceremonies. Um, I'm watching some sort of weird improv act here between Mike and Brian. And it's That's Batman Begins. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no I sorry, I, 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 sorry. I saw, no, I saw you have a copy of Silent Hill Downpour and I was trying to not throw up. <laughs> it's mine. That's Mary's. It's yeah. awful. I, well, you know what? It is, it is not my favorite. Well, yeah, we'll talk but, after. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I just want to book club next week. Sorry, Carrie. This is... <laughs> So, this is Dave has the speaking stick right now. <laughs> I I love Mike. I really do. He, he's like one of my favorite humans of all time. Even though he's thirty two years old now, and <laughs> heading for retirement. Anyway, so we did. I previously picked the book The Ceremonies. So when I had to pick my next book, I was like, I want to pick something very different. So first, I wanted to pick something by a woman, you know, because I think we just need to have more than white dude books on the show. Uh, I wanted to pick something shorter because the ceremonies is a massive tome. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to pick something 
entirely stylistically different from the ceremonies um, because you know again you know it's it, if you didn't read it it starts off slowly and builds and builds and builds, and builds where this <clears> is like you know being shot out of a cannon you know <laughs> yeah and and and, and so I, I think I and I wanted to pick something weird and fucked up so I think I hit it out you of the did here. pretty good yeah there. yeah because <laughs> I had read this previously uh, based on Brian's recommendation and um I went. I read it again last week just to re- remind myself of it. Um, I don't read a lot of this kind of stuff, right? Because um, I think a lot of it is really poorly written, extreme horror. It's just like, ha ha! I'm being gross. You know? This isn't like that. I mean, it's certainly gross. <laughs> let's let's not kid ourselves here. The, the, especially the the last third of the book is, uh, is yeah. fucking insanity. Yeah, it goes <laughs> off the rails pretty good. Yeah, yeah. but it, it's it's well written and. Uh, what I liked about it is a couple of things. First of all, even though it's just completely, <clears throat> it goes completely insane. There's still like a, a sense of humor to it occasionally. Yes, there yeah. is. Yeah, there's like the, you'll read something, and all of a sudden there'll be like a line, um, and it'll just start cracking up. You know, because it's just like it's so absurd, you know, mm-hmm. it's so ridiculous. Um, but it is brutal. I I, I maintain. Uh, can we? Are we doing spoilers now? Because typically we do spoilers because we assume everybody's read the book. Yeah, we'll yeah. we'll do spoilers. It, Mike, you have to decide if you want to sit no, on for the spoilers. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, you know, I I've said before. You know, I've talked about how I, I when I read Jesus Gonzalez's Survivor, I threw the book across the room and I got the part with the baby. Uh, the section of the book with the coat hanger abortions yes. is oh, was right up there. <laughs> with, yeah. Holy fucking shit! This is dark and horrible, and I mean, there's a lot of horrible stuff in this book. Um, but again, like you're reading it, and 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 you know, one point, you know, at the end, you know, where they're talking, and the guy's like, you know, I, I'm gonna have to get a new wife, and 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 the other character says, well, maybe this time, find one doesn't want to give birth to Satan. You know, it's just like it's <laughs> it's hilarious. Like you're laughing, yeah. you can't help but laugh at this. Um, and. You know, obviously, I to me, you know, you read this book and you know the guy's going to buy this this house, and I'm like, this is the worst episode of House Hunters ever. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, he's, yeah, the- you're, you're, you're buying a house, there's the weird Egyptian running around it, and then they find a dead dog in a house, and they find shit statues. Now, at what point do you say, you know what, I, I'm going to go with the, the fixer upper? That, that was kind of a part where I had a little bit of a problem with the believability at certain stages. But, see, but here's like, what I did too. But what I find interesting about this story, first of all, and Nick is a horrible human being. Oh, he's the worst. Yeah. He's, he's human garbage. Um, but as adults, we can all admit there has been somebody in our lives who has pissed us off so much that we will do we would do whatever we could just to get back at them. And his oh. wife in the story has pissed him off to the point where he doesn't give a fuck about anything else but pissing her off. But the thing, the now, thing. Now, it, it's that's we've all had that experience. <clears throat> Maybe we don't yeah. buy the haunted house with the rape cult, but, you know, you know what I mean? You've had that experience where you've been so angry that you don't care. You know, I I, I could see that from, from experiences in my life. I obviously did not, you know, buy a house with murderers in it. And yeah, like that. yeah. But, uh, I don't think 99.9% of us have, have done yeah, that. But, <laughs> <laughs> Quiet, cookie lips. <laughs> These cookie lips are sealed. <laughs> For freshness. <laughs> so you did not have a problem relating to the protagonist, then? No, I mean, you know, I, like I said, I think as, as adults, everybody's had a situation in their lives where there's like somebody where like, I just want to do something to piss you off as much as you piss me off, you know? Okay. And, and I, I think that motivation drives him and makes him turn off what a normal human being would say, yeah, no, I, no. <laughs> you know? And then once he gets sucked into it, it's too late. You know, he can't get out of it. So um, I, I, I got that. Like I said, this is... I don't read a lot of this stuff because I think a lot of it's poorly written, but I think Carrie knocks this out of the park. I just, you know, I really like this book. I enjoyed it the second time. Because it's good to read it again because, you know, 2015 was it four years later now. So I, right. I, my brain doesn't work well, so I forget stuff I read 15 minutes later. So I'd forgotten yeah, a lot of the book. So, um, <laughs> but uh, I would not, like, for example, I told Phoebe, no, you may not read this book. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, yeah I've said the same thing to my yeah, wife. Yeah, she's like, she's, how is she's, that? She's like, like should I read this? I said, I, no, this is not, uh, this is not your kind of thing. You know? Yeah. This is so not her thing. And I would not recommend this to anybody who's not a fan of extreme horror. You know, I would right. not say, oh, yeah, this, try that and see what you think. No, <laughs> you won't like it. I mean, I would say this book is kind of like, if you're looking to get into it, it would be a decent stepping stone because it doesn't go completely... 
too bad. Like right. the end, yes, is yeah. is out there. But compared to some of the other types that I've read, where like you said, I'm just like I close the book. I'm like fuck this garbage. Yeah, it's this is a little softer start. I it's think. a little start. Like I said, is exceptionally well written. It for, is for, for yeah. the particular genre. Um, this is the only thing I've read by hers. I have Cockblock, but I have not read it yet. And now I'm going to read it. Oh, like, Cockblock's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I have to say, too, and I, I've told her this, Carrie is one of my favorite people I've ever met. If you don't follow her on social media, you really need to. She's hysterical. Oh, she is very funny. She is yeah. so funny. She's very funny. And, again, <clears throat> if you meet her and talk to her, and then you read this book, you're like, this you're like where did this, <laughs> yeah. this come from? Where did this <laughs> come from? Yeah, she's so quiet when you talk to her, and then you read this, and this is just complete <laughs> insanity. It's got to come out somewhere. Yeah, I it's just, always the quiet yeah. one. So, um, you know, I, when I was reading again, like, I knew Brian had liked it. I suspected that Mary may not like this. You, I don't, Matt, I don't know your tastes well right. enough yet to, like, what you like and don't like, so I couldn't predict what you, I was thinking you might not like it just based on some comments you made about how you like to nitpick things. Yeah. Well, that's just yeah. my own no, thing no, that no, I do. I have no problem with that. Ruin right? my own life. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to no, make my know, life harder. Actually, right? Dave, <laughs> I, I agree with you. I mean, I I loved the book, mm-hmm. but I'm a fan of extreme horror. Yeah, um, you are m- much more than I. And, and I I particularly like extreme horror when it's done right, and yeah. this was done exceedingly well. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I, like you, I wondered if I I know that Mary likes Carrie. And, you know, Mary is, is very much invested in, in lifting up female writers, but I wondered if this was going to be her cup of tea, and we'll find out mm-hmm. when we get to The Professor. But, like you, this is Matt's first book club, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and we give him, you know, a superb extreme horror novel, but an extreme horror novel. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, well, let's, go, would... let's go to you, Matt. I, All right. Uh... I will say, first, I want to say is that, I had mixed feelings about this book, but it didn't perturb me from going off and buying Halloween Fiend, because I wanted to read that. When, okay. I, when I found out she had a new book coming out, I was like, I like her writing style, you know? So right. I'm going to buy this book because it was th- it was a very smooth read. Like, even though there was stuff in it where you're just like, okay, you were still like, it was so easy to get to it. Mm-hmm. You, you didn't find yourself stumbling over words and like the sentence structure was well done I, I heard one person's comment that was negative they're like oh she writes she says I a lot I'm like well it's written in it's first person first dumbass person tells you to do <laughs> like what the fuck you're supposed to write like <laughs> me yeah <laughs> me get the coat hanger but like that that's not a good that's not a good way to write a book and I'm just like hey, fuck just shut up you've already <laughs> made yourself completely like non-existent in the whole argument of this yeah structure but um some of the things I there, there were certain things that I kind of felt I couldn't believe. Um, uh, could we just pause this for one second to tell the audience that he oh, has yes. a I have a, I have a journal for bat yeah a Batman jur- uh, a yeah. Batman journal in which he has written his notes, which I find delightful. I see, like I was writing in this notebook, and my wife's like, "Why don't you just like fucking type it on your phone?" I'm like, "I'm old school. I gotta write shit now. <laughs> like if I put it on my phone, I'll be like, I I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. I gotta write stuff. I don't know." I'm down with that. Yeah, yeah. It, it just feels better. I don't I handwrite notes. Last How many of us have been at a, a convention or a bookstore signing where the author is going to do a reading and they have it on their phone and then their phone dies yep. or they can't find it on their and then you're sitting there waiting. No, fuck that. I bring paper. Yeah, I, and I, I read a page and I throw it out to the <clears> audience. And I have a shit ton of journals like up. this. And, like, each one's for something different. And my nice. wife thinks I'm nuts, but I'm just like, I don't know. I have... That weird tick about me. I have a little bit of an OCD tendency. In myself. I want to have your lovely. wife on the show. Okay. I, <laughs> she be the best I don't think she'll ever be able to be on, though. She's always working. Um, so, Nick, the, the uh, main person that mm-hmm. takes us through this adventure, um, I get that he's a disgusting human being. Like, he is probably one of the biggest assholes I've ever read in literature, probably. You know? Um, the only thing I don't get behind is, like, he, he's gonna leave her, you know, because he just, he's had it. Like, their marriage is going down the tubes. It's not exciting anymore. Which I'm sure a lot of people can sometimes relate to when you get past, like, the 10, 15 year mark. You're just like, there's nothing new. There's nothing different. Like, it's just, we sit and exist together in the same place. Like, I can get that. But what I don't understand is she tells him he's she's pregnant. You know, he gets pissed because, you know, he didn't want to have a kid. I'm like, okay. Then 
why did you keep fucking her? <laughs> I guess it was like one thing. I was just like, you know, why, why, why keep having unprotected sex if you didn't want to have a kid? So this is somewhat your fault. You know, it takes two eggs to make a scrambled egg. That's not what the saying is, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Um, <laughs> so that, that was like one of the things I don't understand. And then like he has this massive amount of money to go and buy what is quite possibly the shittiest house you could ever buy like I'm picturing in my 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 brain when he's describing it and I'm like this literally looks like the tree house that they built in Ernest Scared Stupid in my mind <laughs> I'd buy the shit out of that that was a great tree house I would too but that's not the part <laughs> um like it, it just like it, it was just, it was a disgusting house which he is calling his dream house and I'm like there is no architect on this planet that would look at that and be like that's my dream I want that especially when he is so like OCD about like, because there's parts in the book where he, like, walks into offices, or he's in, like, this hospital, and he's just like, oh, the, the design is just horrid, it's disgusting, like, why would you pick this with that? And I'm just like, well, you you literally bought Pee-wee's Playhouse, and now you're saying, <laughs> oh, don't put an orange couch next to a green carpet, that's gross. So that was just one thing I was kind of like, eh, but I'm like, you have all this money, why not just fucking still leave her and just pay her child support? Because then you don't have a book. <laughs> okay, I know that's the easy answer, but I'm just saying, like, in my head, like, that's what I was thinking the whole time. I'm like, you hate her this much. Because you, I have an answer because that, you are, you, I would argue you're expecting this protagonist to do the right thing, and he is not a man who does the right, <laughs> right thing. thing. Yeah. Yes, uh, 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 a character of moral value would leave her. Right, but there was even a spot where he said, I'm not leaving her because it would make me look bad. Yeah, right. that's exactly but it. Yeah, yeah. At, at known, the same I've time, he's also... Known people I've known people, that. yeah, exactly. Like, I've known people like this Nick guy. Seriously. I used I'm to work sorry in to hear that. <laughs> no, I, please, I worked in Hollywood. They're all like this. Uh, it, it's, yeah, no. It, to me, it made sense. Right, but there's even parts later on where he's just he says he doesn't give a shit about what people think about what's going on. Yeah, but that's, so that's, that's the, I don't know. But he, he's devolving at yeah. that point. I guess so. I've also known know. people that have gone to extreme lengths to be spiteful to their partners. Yeah, to the point where yeah. I can see somebody doing something like that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't read the book, but from what you guys are saying, like I, I've known people. No, I, 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 I really have. Yeah, I, I said I totally. I've known people like this. I haven't been quite this angry at somebody, but. <laughs> I, I could empathize with that portion of it where someone has pissed you off so much, like I said, that you're willing to just do something fucking horrible to get back out. Right. I feel like we're learning a lot about Dave today that we never really knew. <laughs> <laughs> How did you not know that people piss me off? Like, really? That, that hasn't come up in the last 200 episodes? I'm shocked. But it, I know what you mean. It's kind of like Dave's like a title locked planet. Like we usually see the side where the sun's kind of shining on it. Yeah. And now we're getting to that side where it's like dark, and it's just like if I had the money, I'd buy a house to fuck somebody's life. <laughs> China has landed on the dark side of Dave. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I can see, I can see what you guys are saying. I just, I don't know. I guess because me personally, I've never had that kind of a connection where I felt like. I would be willing to blow my life savings just to fuck with somebody that I'm partially also the reason why I'm in the boat that I'm in. So that, you know, and none of my critiques are saying that I hated anything. It was just things that as I'm reading, would it just popped in my head and I was just kind of like, I figured I'd bring it up and then maybe you guys could explain nope. it to me a little bit. Um, I suspect that maybe, I could be wrong, an element of uh, extreme horror in general where things are grotesque in both the traditional sense and the modern sense. Right. Almost like out there, you know. Right. And I get that, yeah, because it's like you're going to write an extreme horror, so you can't have a guy who's like, oh, I feel kind of bad about this, maybe I shouldn't do this anyway. Cause, and you wouldn't have a story, like Brian pointed out to me earlier. Um, <laughs> so I, that was one of the things I, that while I was reading, I was just kind of like, eh. And then, like, there was a couple things I had about the cult that didn't make sense to me. Like, the whole purpose of the cult was to try and breed as many kids as possible, mm -hmm. but yet, like, they let a transsexual person live in the town, and that completely doesn't help out their cause at all, and that person knows all of their inner doings, and at any point could literally just unravel the whole thing for anybody new that wanders into town, which she kind of does at the end of the book anyway. So I was kind of like, isn't that 
isn't that like a thorn in your side that if you're willing to just sacrifice people anyway, that you could just fucking kill that person and then you don't have that thing to worry about? Well, isn't that just like the Lovecraft character from the Shadow Over Innsmouth of the Old Drunk that didn't convert to the Church of Dagon and they're just, he's just there and they're like, yeah, no one will believe him anyway. Yeah, I guess. Uh, that's the element I took from it, yeah. Absolutely. Well, so the, the, the other thing is, well, she also needed those hormones. She needs hormones, so she wasn't so, going to... It was, yeah, it was kind of like a, a, you know, I really need this because this will hurt me if I don't have it, so I'll keep quiet. I'll keep quiet about it. Yeah. Plus, I, I, the, they're only, I'm trying to figure out a way to phrase this so I piss off people listening to the show. Indigenous people. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. No. <laughs> Manual work? They're not, let's just say they're not killing adults. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They're not. But they were going to kill Nick. Yeah, that's also because he had a second. Yeah, but then yeah. <laughs> so because he's not going to help their cause, so they were going to get rid of him. So that was the thing where I was kind of like, "Then why do you keep this?" Well, person? but is he is he actively going to fuck with them though? Like, well, he doesn't even get a chance person? if he if he was going to, he wouldn't even have had a chance to. Because if like they've got it, this other person under their thumb, then that would make sense for them to leave him alone. But I'll be curious to know what the listeners think about this, and it's a good time to remind you all we will have a discussion thread up on the Hard Show with Brian Keen Facebook page. Uh, so, so leave your thoughts in the comments there, and we'll make Matt answer them. You know, we haven't made you <laughs> answer listener comments on Facebook yet. It's a treat. Oh, I'm sure it is. It's a real treat. Yes. <laughs> As if I need anything more depressing in my life. Um, I don't know, there, there was just some of the things that in my head I was just kind of like, eh. I don't, like, you know, I felt like it was maybe a slight plot hole, but... I still enjoyed the read throughout the whole thing. There was, like, one instance where I kind of felt like something was just kind of put in there to be, like, like ooh, shocking. Because it was just, like, it happens, and then it just goes away, like, instantly. It was just, like, the first mention of, like, feces. It was just, like, the feces statues. It's okay, like, yeah. oh, yeah, somebody's making love to these feces statues in your house. Which then I find, like, Nick just being like, huh, that's weird. And he's just like, oh, well, I'll sign the papers tomorrow. Have you, you, know? ever, have like, you ever been to <laughs> Columbia and have... <laughs> Yes, I have, actually. <laughs> well, it's like the worst episode of House Hunters ever. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. so, yeah, I, I don't yeah, know. I, I, I'll agree with you there. I was also like, he's like, <laughs> even I, who like, I'm reading this, I'm like, <laughs> you get to that point and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, because there was like the dog, the feces yeah, statues, yeah. and then like, even like when they first start moving in the first day, he's like, there's weird shit going on. Where'd that doll come from? Oh, now I'm getting kind of scared. Oh, I'll stay. <laughs> So I was just kind of like, I, I get it, because you signed the papers, you're in for it now. And you're still trying to get back at that bitch for having a kid. But, I don't know, there was just like, in my mind, there was a couple red flags where I'd just be like, I ain't signed these papers yet. And there's literally been statues of feces in this place I was thinking about buying. I think I'm just going to, I'll mean, find another house to wreak I mean, revenge on. If you're in L.A., they'd, they'd be, honestly, they'd be like, this is like modern art. It's like, it's <laughs> Dadaism. Yeah, and they'd still charge you like 3000 yeah, a month to win. It's like, you're it's like, like uh, the, the sequence where he gets a vasectomy yeah. uh, is very accurate and very well written. Yeah. Yeah, I had one when I was 20. I, I've heard years I've so. heard the stories of how it feels and everything. Yeah, and no, it was, like, it was actually, huh. I was like, when I was reading, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is really, this is really well done. And that's one thing I will give her, like, for being a, a, a woman writing this. She, she wrote a man, like, amazingly oh, perfectly, well. Perfectly, yeah. Like, you wouldn't, if, if you didn't see pictures of her, or right. knew who she was and you saw C.V. Hunt, you would imagine it was a man that wrote yeah, this. Yeah, I agree. Like, she did very well with that. Yeah. I mean, so that was just some of the things I had. Uh, I, like, the ending to me, I, it was a little crazy. Uh, this, this kind of book isn't my necessary cup of tea, but at the same time, I can't say that I won't go and read more things in the genre. I'm um, curious, now you've mentioned the ending was crazy. Have you ever read Bentley Little? No, Bentley I Little. Have you ever watched any of Cronenberg's movies? Yes. Yeah? Because uh, Carrie told me, you know, she and I were messaging back and forth. Bentley Little, she mentions at the beginning of the book, is you know, having a huge influence on her. Uh, she told me, in fact, she said, Bentley Little was definitely a huge influence, with a little bit of Brett Easton Ellis and Dennis Cooper as far as the satirical and transgressive aspects. Um... I remember when I talked to the cover artist, I mentioned I saw it in my head as sort of a later Cronenberg movie. Cold and sterile with a touch of body horror. Dead Ringers. Dead Ringers. Yeah. Is exactly, yeah. See, I don't even have to do the historical aspects. <laughs> Mike is here to... Um, 
She also, I found this interesting. She says, uh, there was an element of thinking of it as a crazy prequel to The Omen. Okay, I can which, see that. Which, yeah. yeah. I can definitely yeah, see that. I can um, see that. You know, but yeah, often in Bentley Little's novels, it, they start out in this exact same setting. You know, modern America, usually suburbia, uh, and, you know, the last half of the novel goes full on bizarro. Just yeah. crazy shit. Um, you know, but I also thought Nick, now I'm not a fan of, uh, what's that Brett Easton Ellis novel? American Psycho. American Psycho. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a fan of the novel or the movie. I understand why they are so popular, why they are so iconic, why they are seminal and why Lombardo gets a hard on just talking about it. Absolutely. I have four different language copies of American Psycho. Yeah, but they were, they were, they were never for me. Um, <laughs> but you know, much much like American Psycho, it's a completely unlikable character. Yes, used as the protagonist. Um, it is Batman. extremely hard to do that in fiction. It's a little easier on film. You know, you look at Tony Soprano, Walter White, all these anti heroes. It's harder to do in fiction. Um, I always point to Gene O'Neill's The Burden of Indigo, in which the protagonist is a pedophile. There's one thing you know about me. I loathe pedophiles. Yeah. And it's to Gene's credit that I end up empathizing with that character in that novel because he does it so well. Um, I can't say that I empathize with Nick. No. But I understand his... I understand the character's motivations. Um, I thought I thought Carrie definitely handled that. And I, I think that's where you really see the, the, the Brett Easton Ellis influence. But... Nobody tunes in to hear our thoughts, Dave. No, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't know why we talk. They, yeah. they tune in to hear Professor San Giovanni, yes. <laughs> and now we're going to be quiet for the next 20 minutes while the professor holds court. That makes us all look dumb. Yeah. Okay, okay. <clears throat> um, I know you guys thought I wasn't going to like this book, but I did. And here's why. Okay, this would not be my... I know, great reveal. Um, this would not be the kind of book I would pick up on my own. I am not a fan of extreme horror. Uh, I, as I mentioned before, I think there's an element to, there's a grotesqueness and in the traditional sense, the old way that you'd use the term grotesque is exaggerated. Uh, the new term is more, you know, it has more connotations of gross and, you know, and, you know, disgusting over the top kind of stuff. Um, and this book it does both. So I, I could, I could set aside for the purpose of analyzing the book, I could, I could accept that there are certain things that are a result of the grotesqueness of the book. What made this book, I think, far more palatable to me than most extreme horror? One of the, the thing that I think is so well done about this, or there's a couple things, but it's the consistency of the development of this guy, Nick. Because in order to really appreciate the story as a whole, you have to understand the kind of person that this man is, okay? Um, he's essentially a sociopath or a psychopath. I tend to think he's a sociopath because... Um, I As a high-functioning sociopath, I take issue with that. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, just, just wait, Brian <laughs> oh, Keene. Just wait. I am a successful sociopath. Uh, I don't <laughs> think he is a high-functioning sociopath. I don't think that he is connected to the world at all okay and the reason i say that he's not a psychopath is that and again you know psychology people can correct me if i'm wrong but um i have some experience in abnormal psychology and psychology and i think the difference is that while a sociopath is disconnected and lacks a certain degree of empathy or sympathy for people psychopaths are like that but they're also compulsive this guy's obsessive I wouldn't know I don't know that he's necessarily compulsive but um, he definitely has OCD we can oh, yeah. see that um, he has an obsession with cleanliness he puts his shoes in the washer every time he every time he wears them he washes his hands after shaking hands with people um, he can't stand the flu one of the reasons that he he doesn't initiate sex more often is he can't stand the fluids of people like drying on him I mean he's he's an incredibly uh, obsessive germaphobe okay uh he's very sensitive i'd say hypersensitive to smells and certain sensations yeah he but sees germs everywhere don't bother him then 
because they said that they were going to have everything cleaned. Okay. And and he had no he didn't he never saw it he had no part in it, um, but yeah I mean every time he walked into that room he'd have to go out and wash his hands and clean. It, it's it, because that kind of thing is psychological. Um, yeah. He's claustrophobic. He mentions at one point he is paranoid. Uh, he he says things like to his wife he mentions to Eve that um, he's not even sure the baby's his. Now I I know that he says that to hurt her, but. There is an underlying underlying paranoia in all of his react all of his relationships with people that he thinks that they are somehow out to get him, uh, that they're out to hurt him deliberately. That it it really is still all about him. Yeah, I think there was like several times in the book that he mentioned that he thought she was having an affair. Right. With absolutely no evidence to back exactly. that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Or he'd, he'd mention that people are giving him nasty looks, or that they're giving him an attitude, or that they're somehow targeting him for something. Um, he's one of those people where he exists and the world exists around him to, for him to interact with. Um, now, he mentions early on, a couple times, he says, I wasn't much for sympathy or deep emotional conversations. He also mentions extreme neglect in his childhood. He says that he, uh, his parents never showed him love, they didn't want a child, and they made it very clear to him that they never wanted him. So... That I think that rejection from your parents, it, there there is a there a very strong psychological correlation between that and and OCD and and being a control freak. He's definitely a control freak. Oh yeah. Uh, I think a lot of sociopaths are control freaks. <laughs> um. And the listening audience can't see that look you gave me. <laughs> but there is, I mean, there is a certain element there that. Uh, you know, his, his childhood is why he is the way he is. Now, he's also incredibly detached from the world around him. He's detached from his wife completely, but he's also detached from everyone else. And I think that that detachment, that sociopathy that prevents him from understanding how normal people function can explain a lot of the things that people might perceive as plot holes. That's why this thing was so cohesive to me was because... I think that the fact that he only saw women in this town doesn't really occur to him that other than Adam, he's not seeing any men around because to him, the world, it, it, it exists for him, you know, so he's not really worried that there aren't other men around. It doesn't really, you know, uh, the, the little, the, the fact that he can be so vindictive is something that socio sociopaths always have to get revenge. They always have to get one up. Okay. Um, and the only emotion... See, people think sociopaths have no emotions. That's not true. They do. But their primary anger, you know, is, is pri the primary emotion. Everything is sort of... Guilt uh, is non-existent. But sadness, you know, morphs into anger. Uh, they, But the only emotions that matter are their own. That's the difference. They don't understand that other people might have an emotional reaction to something. Um, now... What I think is interesting, though, is that well, I think what crosses this over from, say, maybe like a narcissistic personality disorder to actual sociopath or psychopath, an emerging and probably, as, as Brian said, a devolving one, is that as he has these experiences, uh, all of his sexual arousal becomes quickly associated with violence. And now usually with, so with psychopaths, at least, and serial killers, that happens in your teenage years. They, they, they make a, a connection early on to violence, and so that after a while, violence is the only thing that gets them off. He seems like a late bloomer. I think he says he's 38 or something. He's in his 30s. Yeah. Um, but that would suggest that maybe that was always there, that there was always a connection to violence. Uh, and, and there are little things that happen throughout, which... I think, you know, we, we talked about how, you know, here's a woman writing a very convincing man, and not just a very convincing dude, but like a very convincing, aggressive, hateful, vengeful kind of man, you know, a mm -hmm. very specific kind of man. And, and she nails it every step of the way with every sentence. Uh, this man is consistently not just an asshole, but a dangerous person. And uh, he... You know, he's he's abusive. He's an abuser, really. And, and and she captures this the fact that he can that he can hurt people so easily and not feel anything about it. 
you know, there's there's a, a you know severe disconnect there. Um, he has a capacity for intense cruelty, which for like the first two thirds of the book is primarily verbal. But yeah. when he fantasizes, when he watches porn, um, he looks. It, 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 to, to him, he, he almost gets off on hate fucking people. You know, the idea of hate yeah, fucking people. There was that one where he was like specifically looking for videos of like young girls that were being like tortured, tortured in a sense because yeah. he wanted and i think he said like i like to see that look on their face yes. where they're like trapped and they know it exactly yeah and it's anytime he gets angry at a woman which happens fairly easily um it, it seems to morph quickly into some type of sexual arousal that he connects to violence so mm -hmm. there's that that you know back and forth um you know, between the sex and the violence, that to me is one of the true horrors of the book. I mean, there are plenty of disgusting things that happen in this book which are horrific, but not nearly as horrific as the uh, overarching idea that the good guy that we're supposed to be rooting for is probably one of the worst human beings on the planet, and that that is a new norm somehow, that that is a commonplace thing somehow that people like this exist. Um, but he, he, you know, I mentioned he's get, he gets increasing sexual arousal from sadism. He's a sadist, which is, you know, sort of pushing him toward the land of psychos. He sees women as objects. They're, annoy they're either annoying him by little things that they do that they couldn't possibly imagine would annoy anybody. Um, or they're somehow tempting him. And, you know, it's not his fault that he fucks the doctor, even though his wife just had, you know, a miscarriage in the other room. Uh, because, you know, she started it. That's kind of his attitude. Um, he thinks of women as needy, petulant, selfish children, which is essentially what he is, you know, in a lot of ways. Now, what I thought was interesting is, and I don't know if Carrie meant this, but there's a, there's almost a parallel to The Wicker Man, um, but in a completely different setting. Uh, the Wicker Man, if you're not familiar with it, was an, uh, an old movie from the 60s, uh, yeah. and then they remade it again, where this very puritanical kind of guy. Sorry, I was just laughing about the, the re, like, things from the remake flashed in my head and started laughing. <laughs> well, the, the remake is not nearly as, as sexually expressive as, as the original. Because it's a modern movie and it wouldn't fly. Because it wouldn't yeah. fly. But, I mean, the original had orgies. I mean, it had all kinds of, everybody yeah. having sex with everybody. But the idea was that there was this pagan community yes. that required sacrifice uh, from time to time. But yeah, essentially I, I got was very it, sexually, yeah. you know, very sexually active that the sex energy was connected to nature and it was connected to uh, their whole belief system, which drove their entire society. And there's, there's a parallel to that in this town. It is a drastically warped version of this. I don't think that this was intended to be any uh, realistically pagan uh, kind of you know, kind of society, but there are certain aspects to it. There's that horned shadow that uh, yeah. he sees in one of the pictures, I think. Um, there is uh, the doll made of rocks mm -hmm. that is left on the bed, and we still don't know, I don't think, even at the no, end, I don't think that was who ever. actually left that doll there, um, but it's a fertility doll, mm -hmm. really. Uh, there is sex as a generator of energy, which a lot of pagan religions believe is, you know, is, is true. That, uh, that energy that's, you know, generated from having sex is very powerful. There's a prominence of women throughout the town, which again, I mentioned he doesn't seem to notice all that much because this town exists to serve him in a way. And, and women are, are objects that he enjoys looking at. There's a circle in the woods with a campfire. I mean, if at this point you're not getting the <laughs> idea that maybe there's some kind of which that, craft situation that was another thing here. where I was like, you find this um, and you're just like, eh, maybe it was the Cub Scouts. But, but throughout <laughs> all of these, all of these warning signs, he is so disconnected from society and from a certain degree of reality that I, I, I thought that it was consistent. I, I like that he doesn't, he doesn't seem to notice the sort of even biblical implication of having a wife named Eve who meets a guy named Adam. In a place called Edenville. Yes, you and know? it was actually blatantly brought to his attention like several times. Right. And he just dismiss he dismisses it. He's like, no, I'm Nick. There's like, very I'm not talking much a, about you. Right, <laughs> like, right. There's, there's very much a sense of the, the ancient rites and rituals in here, which again, I think to an extent, pale in comparison to the nonchalance 
of it, you know, to, to the fact that these people are not nearly as horrified by what's going on as they should be. Um, their rape is fairly rampant. And one of the things that I think is, is interesting, and again, I think it's, I don't mean to make it a sexist thing, but there's a way that women handle rape, even in extreme horror like this, that is different than the way a lot of men handle rape in stories. That's not to say that men don't handle it okay, but women handle it differently. Uh, as a woman, I might have gotten maybe the inkling that Carrie was a woman, even if I didn't know who she was mm -hmm. reading this book, because she is so far more aware of how women are reacting to Nick mm -hmm. than I think a man would be. Um, now, I think for storytelling purposes, she handles it by him not really reacting to these reactions, him not really thinking too much about it, but she is describing them in the background. She is describing the effects that, you know, the kinds of things that women notice that women do or that women do when they are in the presence of men like this. Um, and I, I, I think that, too, added a certain layer to the story that, that a lot of people might not see in thinking that it's just sort of this, you know, like gratuitous extreme horror right. thing. Um, when she describes this man's rape, now he's raped at least twice. Once by a woman and once by a man. And yes. the thing is, is that I think most people look at this and they only think of the rape when Adam rapes him. Right. But what the doctor does to him is rape too, technically. Yeah. Um, and there's, I, I think, again, because he is so disconnected and because everything happens so fast, we don't necessarily see the trauma of this. But... Uh, I also feel like because when the doctor did it, he was still seeing it as a female doing something sexually to him. Right. So he didn't consider that as rape. Exactly. It didn't like sit into his subconscious at all at that point. Right. When Adam does it, now granted, I, I do kind of feel like after Adam does it, he still kind of brushes it under the rug pretty quickly. Because I think he's ashamed. And yeah. he mentions that. He mentions that it, you know, he felt humiliated, but he only kind of glosses over <clears throat> his feelings because... Again, I feel it's fairly consistent with this kind of person that anything that hurts him, anything that embarrasses him, anything that makes him feel insecure is very quickly clamped down away. on yeah. and locked away. And, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to say, oh, this woman had her way with me. He wouldn't think of that as rape, but it is. He wouldn't yeah. think of it that way. Um, but what Adam did to him was a violation. Yes. You know, and that was something he was not okay with. Uh, and, and again, it... Um, the fact that when he when he relates to Morgan as a woman, when he does he, uh, because he I mean he has I think a sexual fantasy about her, um, but it's like a hate fucking fantasy because yeah. he thinks that she gave him an attitude and um, you know he still is is nasty and ungrateful. I mean even after she saved his life. Oh, and yeah. bought she, him clothes. She finds him clothes him and he's food. like, what is this? I, yeah. I can't wear these. And she's like, you're lucky I fucking found anything. He still treats her like a <laughs> subservient kind of person. Yeah. Um, but what I've noticed, and again, I, again, it's consistent right through the end with his character, is that when he finds out that she was once a man, yep. he treats her differently. Yep. Uh, then all of a sudden it's almost like he can kind of relate to her. Yeah. And it, it shows that sort of that sort of almost black and white thinking that these kind of people have. Did you catch that, Dave? Yeah. Yeah? yeah okay. He changes his attitude toward her toward the end. Um, and, and just to basically sum everything up, because I know I've been talking for a long time, that what I found, I always look for what I think the true horror message is in something. And if it's only like, you know, ooh, creepy, look at me because I'm gross, it do, the book doesn't work for me. But what I liked about this book was that to me, the horror is not from the wanton violations, okay? It's not from the repeated conceptions and abortions or the infidelities, all of which were horrible, grotesquely horrible. Mm -hmm. But it's really this lack of sympathy, empathy, and human caring, which per pervades the book, and, you know, which is essentially told from the point of view of somebody who is incapable of any kind of... Um, softness any kind i mean the, the things he says to his wife the things he says to other women um the way he thinks 
about people. You know, it, that to me is terrifying. That to me that there are people out there that can be so cruel and heartless and and so intent on getting revenge for their what they perceive are a person's motivations or a person's you know behavior that that to me is the real horror i feel like what carrie is saying is that like you know this is it's fairly normal that people treat each other like shit it's fairly normal that these deviant people um and deviant right down to i can't care about you i i am incapable of seeing your point of view to me that's the real horror of the book and i think that's why i liked it more than i would like extreme horror normally because there's something deeper there and uh all, again although i don't know that i would be inclined to read extreme horror in general i thought carrie did a really yeah. excellent job but you would read extreme horror if it had a, a similar message like that yes i would actually Lombardo, because... i wouldn't you agree that the Pig by Edward Lee has that same message, albeit it, albeit his writing is comedic. Yeah, it's played for the, laughs. The, Carrie plays it straight. The but, Pig has a lot going on below the surface. Yeah. a lot of Edward Lee stuff does actually. Does. People just don't give it and the that, time to. Perhaps later it. in the year, I will I will pick the Pig when it's my turn to pick. <laughs> but speaking of picking, Professor, yes. it's your turn to pick our book for March. We're doing this in March, so it'll be our book for May. Mm -hmm. Have you decided what that is? I have. Um, it, Here it is, is not going to be Ed Lee. <laughs> it is not going to be Edward Lee's The Pig. Second choice was Atlas Shrugged, right? <laughs> <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> That's May of 2020. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. I'm um, picking War and Peace. <laughs> I... Honestly, I mean, I don't think it's any surprise that I, I want to pick a Ramsey Campbell book. Okay. Okay. And I'm leaning toward The Doll Who Ate His Mother. The Doll Who Ate His Mother? Yes. Um, you know what? I am fairly certain it is available, but let's let's go to Amazon rather than the distributor, Mike. <laughs> well, you can't, you can't you can While he's looking stuff that up, like that, uh, I wanted to say the one thing you were mentioning about the uh, subtext in the, the whole book. Uh, I loved how it was like, with the cult, they were trying to basically bring Satan right. back in the world through all these births. And I think they said they only got to like 300. It was like 338 or something, yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So like, we'll never really know if they make it or not. You know, right. if, they, if they actually do, we'll never know. But something could throw a wrench in their plans and it all falls apart. But Nick is real. He's yes. here and he is a despicable piece of shit. Exactly. So even exactly. if this being never comes to be, there's it's still sort of somebody ephemeral. just yeah. as horrible that exists. Right. And that was one right. I, I liked the idea of that. Okay. And the thing too is that he, he he never I mean he's this is a man who's watching these women uh copulate with all these other people, right? And then uh they're hurt by their own people to the point where they're crying. I mean, the, the, the women who have these these abortions are sitting on. Yeah. They're not even sitting. They're they're still like bent over whatever this bench yeah. or whatever, and they're crying. And the women are kind of consoling each other. Like the the, the two the Eve and I think the girl who went before. Mm -hmm. And then there's like a, a thirteen year old at the end. I mean, yeah. this is the kind of thing again. Um, and and there's a horror in this because I think it's something. I venture to say that maybe women are slightly more aware of than, than men are, that your body can't take that. It can't no. take being pregnant and, and having an abortion, being pregnant, having an abortion, being... I mean, it cannot take repeated uh, instances. It can take it, you know, once or twice. I think, I, I think they said medically you can have up to eight children or you can have up to, like, three or four abortions before your body starts to fall apart. Right. And, you know, that's not a that's not a moral, you know, judgment being passed down on anybody who does anything with their bodies. Just that medically, from what I understand, your body starts to fall. And there is there is a disconnect with these people that. Yeah, that they can just keep doing that they this. can just keep doing yeah. that. Like that to me is the scary thing. It's not so much what they're doing. It's how it's, they're going about it. it it's yeah. it's the the at the, the the complete and utter uh disregard disregard for for, yeah. for 
other people yeah. and, and how it might affect it's them. It's just their goal, not who is there to get them to right. it. And how they feel about themselves because, uh, you know, you, you wonder at what point, what is it about this God? That's That was the only question I had is, what is it about this God that inspires such religious fervor? And if it's just that you can somehow be a mother, I think there's other ways around it. So there must be something that drives these people. Right. But it's completely devoid of humanity. And that's what I think is scary. Yeah. You know what I, I think agree. is scary? What? A seminal work like Ramsey Campbell's The Doll Who Ate His Mother is currently not in print. Only <gasps> available in used editions on Amazon US. So... Ooh. I think we're going to have to wait till next week, Professor, and you're going to have to pick a different book pick a different by book. Ramsey okay. Campbell. All right. All right. So we will have that for you next week, folks. Uh, what we won't have for you next week is Lombardo. Unfortunately. So, Mike, anything you'd like to tell the people before uh, we close out here? <sighs> Just don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. <laughs> don't give up on me. No. <laughs> uh, no, if you, uh, you guys check out I'm Dreaming for White Dooms Day. ScreamTeamRelasing.com. I'd really appreciate it. Every copy we sell is one step closer to being able to make another movie. And I mean that in complete sincerity because in the indie world, if you pirate something, you actually are fucking over the artist tremendously. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't think people realize how much it matters that people actually spread the word and pick up a single copy can make a big difference. So please check it out. That's right. Speaking of pirating, um, yeah, there's a big piracy story going around in the industry this week. Mm -hmm. We're not ignoring it. Uh, I'm just doing some fact-checking, you know, lest litigation attorneys <laughs> be called on me. Uh, but we, we do hope to have the facts in that story for you next week. Also, you might have heard that pedophile Ed Kramer was arrested again. We're I not ignoring that story either. Again, we're doing some fact-checking, and we will have that story for you next week. You know what else we're also going to have? An interview with Al going back. Very Except cool. it's not us doing the interview. For the first time, the horror show is going to let someone other than us handle the interviewing. And that interviewer is... Well, you know what? Let's wait. Let's save that for next week. You'll find out who is sitting down with Al going back to ask him questions. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this show, you might also enjoy Matt's side project, Grindcast. Uh, you might also enjoy watching Dave live stream most nights at twitch.tv slash meteor notes. You might also enjoy Christopher Golden and I talking about when we were young and how comic books were better in the 70s and 80s. We do that every week on Defenders Dialogue. And if you enjoyed the last 20 minutes of this show when, when we got serious and Mary outsmarted everybody in the room, then you will absolutely enjoy Mary's show every week, Cosmic Shenanigans. Both Defenders Dialogue and Cosmic Shenanigans are available wherever you listen to the horror show, and they're made available by the Project Entertainment Network. Please go to the ProjectEntertainmentNetwork.com, consider supporting them on Patreon, consider buying some horror show with Brian Keen swag, or click Contact and tell Armand Rosamilia that you wish to buy an ad on this show. Speaking of ads on the show, one more time, I want to thank Robert Kent, the host of Middle Grade Ninja Podcast, and his new book, The Book of David. It's a serial horror novel, serialized horror novel written in the style of early Stephen King. Uh, it's available as a single volume or five serialized novels, the first of which is available to download for free wherever fine ebooks are sold. It's also available in paperback for more information head to middlegradeninja.com. That's the book of David, Robert Kent, middlegradeninja.com. We'll see you next week, folks. See Bye. you guys. Bye. Bye. Hello. Is anybody out there? Anybody. This is Jim Cobb. If you're hearing this, the worst has happened. I've recorded a podcast at the end of the world and will broadcast it on channel PEN every Friday. It's all about the apocalypse, books, movies, TV, how much food and water will you need your bunker, all that kind of stuff. Excuse me, sir. You're going to have to keep the noise down. You're in a library and you're scaring the kids. The world hasn't ended yet. Sorry, ma'am. Shh, you're in the library at the end of the world with host Jim Cobb. Fridays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.